This is Dylan FM, a freak music club podcast on Bob Dylan. If you love Dylan, you're in the right place. This season, we're going deep on Time Out of Mind to celebrate its 25th anniversary. Here's your host, Craig Danielov. Robin Hitchcock is a singer-songwriter that AllMusic.com calls, quote, among alternative rock's father figures and the closest thing the genre has to a Bob Dylan. They then note that this is not surprising because Hitchcock himself claims Dylan is his biggest influence. As you'll hear in a few moments, it actually goes further, as he explains that Dylan is, musically one presumes, a part of his DNA, along with a selection of other top-tier 60s musicians and songwriters. Through a 40-year career that began leading the influential Soft Boys and has continued with revered albums ever since, Robin has put that DNA to good use with catchy, idiosyncratic, and well-crafted songs and performances. He's covered Dylan quite a lot in live performance, and in 2002, he released a double album called Robin Sings, which offers 16 compelling takes on songs ranging from Desolation Row up through Time Out of Minds, Not Dark Yet. That last song is one that Robin recently performed for us at a private show with Emma Swift. We've posted that performance to YouTube for the first time, along with the release of this podcast. You can find a link in the show notes. As with the other musicians we've talked to in this series, Robin has a deep and interesting perspective on Bob, and we talk to him about the arc of Dylan's career and his memories and observations of Time Out of Mind in the conversation that follows. Robin himself has a new album out this week called Shuffle Mania, which I'll highly recommend. It's not on the streaming services, however, so you'll have to jump online and order your very own LP, CD, or cassette. Links to the order page and some nice videos where you can check out a few of the songs are also in the show notes. What follows is a portion of my conversation with Robin Hitchcock. There is an extended version of this podcast. It's about twice as long for our Plus and Premium members. Membership gets you these longer versions of every episode and a bunch more. And for just a few weeks, you can join for as little as $5 a month. Please visit freakmusic.club slash join to learn more. We have no ads in these shows, so joining is a great way to support our work. Actually, you should visit freakmusic.club even if you're not ready to sign up because there's a lot of cool stuff there that any Dylan fan would enjoy. But for now, here's our conversation with Robin Hitchcock. All right. Hello, Robin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Craig. I, look, I'm really happy to talk to you for a, a whole lot of reasons. One is you're clearly a, a Dylan expert of various flavors, and you've sung and covered Bob quite a lot. I, I'd like to hear what you thought in the period before Time Out of Mind. Did you expect something else to happen? Where Did you think those periods were as low as other people did? I thought he was just increasingly unhappy. You know, my take on Dylan is that he he kind of supernovaed in 66, you know, 67, and gradually kind of reassembled himself as, a, as an adult and, and uh, tried to be a family man and, and tried to escape or transcend the position that he put himself into or the world had put himself into, you know. And then, then the family broke down, the marriage broke down, whatever it was, and, and he kind of began to, um, he began to repeat himself. He began to, as somebody would have said back then, revert into the same trips. So you got him going through the long hair, polka dot shirts and drugs phase, you know, again and, and again. Um, and, but increasingly unhappily, I, I felt that like, you know, Street legal, really, he sounded like he was on the rope. So he, that, that tour was good, the 78 tour. You know, he was still in in good shape. He was still speaking to the audience, and his voice wasn't as sort of mangled as it became. In a lot of ways, that was one of his more satisfying appearances. But the record itself, he just sounds, he sounds forsaken, you know, and so when he just when he, he found Jesus and God and everything, I thought he, he's ready for it. You know, it was a as somebody said at the time, oh God, he's he's betrayed his fans yet again. Uh it's his fourth betrayal. You know, he went 
He uh, stopped doing protest songs. Then he went electric. Then he went country. And now he's gone Christian. You know, you can see a pattern. But uh, I, I thought the Christianity kind of, it, it gave him a, a rock to stand on. It gave him an armature to base his life around. You know, when you've been the most important person in the world for 15 years and everybody's looked at you going, wow, wow, Craig, where's it at? You know, or, hey, Robin, you know, tell us how should we live? You know, it, 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 which is what Dylan had. You, you look for something bigger than yourself. And he had for a few years, he got that with Christianity. And then that faded away. And sort of 83 onwards, I, I just thought he was just going down and down and down and down into the dark. And I, I saw him on the Petty Tour in 87 just seemed like a soul in torment, you know. Um, everyone was going, yay, oh, wow, he's done like a rolling stone, you know, and, yeah, sure, he had the leather pants on. Yeah, sure, he was had long hair. Sure, he was smoking cigarettes, and, you know, but Dylan's a, a great transmitter. He, he, he has to protect himself, but the way he feels, I think, comes out really directly, which is why we constantly turn to Dylan because he's such a – he's emotionally honest, he doesn't necessarily tell you the literal truth, but he tells you the emotional truth, certainly about himself. And I just, you know, I just couldn't listen to him really. That he just sounded so unhappy. And then, you know, he did those a lot of covers. Didn't seem to be writing songs. Kind of scrapey, wretched voice. And and then time out of mind came out. Mine came out, and I thought, my God, he really has bottomed out. You know, how can my initial feeling when I heard that was kind of anger. How can somebody so respected and so admired and, you know, such a, such a pivot for, for a whole culture to rotate around? You know, how can this man who's the closest thing many of us had to a messiah or a, a sage or whatever, you know, how can he be so wretched, you know? And, um, and then gradually I listened to the record and it sank in and I thought, well, he does feel so wretched, but there's so much in here that's he really does you know this is it you have to live with it we all have our own personal dylan and um it was interesting it's possible that he was he'd been taken off drink and drugs i mean since then he's actually been in pretty good shape and he's been pretty high functioning in a way that makes me think he may have had to clean up but who knows you know he's so you've got all those bottles of bourbon he's got so who knows how sober he is i mean basically craig i thought it, it was a downward graph right the way from desire down to good as i've been to you or something and then and then sort of hitting the bottom with time out of mind but also producing a, another masterwork you know something up there with blood on the tracks i mean the thing is that his masterworks None of them is even an echo of a previous one. You know, if, if if Rough and Rowdy Ways is the most recent masterwork, it doesn't bear much relation to Time Out of Mind, which bears very little relation to Blood on the Tracks, which, you know, is a million miles from Blonde on Blonde. So, uh, you know, I just, I see him as constantly moving, I suppose, and, which is why people, I think, are constantly frustrated by him because they think they've got him. Ah, this is this is my my Dylan, you know, <laughs> but boy, nobody does. So that's the you're the first interpretation I've heard that sees time out of mind as the bottom as well as a masterpiece, as opposed to kind of the turning point up. Now you may be speaking about you know where you think he was personally. I mean, is that a fair separation that musically, oh, yeah. lyrically, you, you think he turned? But your your reading just is personally. Obviously, the songs reflect. What was the word Michael Gray uh, had used? Desperation or something is, you know, there's a pervasive negativity through that album. Well, I think there's been a pervasive negativity through Dylan's work. I mean, Nashville skyline aside, Dylan's stuff is always a bummer. It's just really kind of, it's a very enriching bummer. I mean, I suppose, you know, <laughs> you could say that so was, uh, so is Samuel Beckett or, you know, so is um, those Russian authors, I don't know, <laughs> you know. Dostoevsky and I, I don't know, kind of the Thomas Hardy, you know, he's, you know, he sure isn't a, well, he is a barrel of laughs, but he's not a, but he's not a vat of sunshine. I think he, I think emotionally time out of mind is about him hitting the bottom, but maybe artistically he was, he was bouncing back, but I, I don't think he, 
I don't know. I've, I'm, I'm really more interested in how he feels and how he transmits. I mean, I didn't think the rec- 80s records were bad. I think there were some great songs in them. But I think he still had a ways to go down. You know, Sweetheart Like You, which Emma sings beautifully, I, I've really got into that because of Emma singing it. When I hear Dylan's version, I just he just sounds so kind of used. <laughs> I mean, he sounded like an old man to begin with when he was 21, you know. Hard rain's going to fall and blowing in the wind. You know, they they are not. It's not I want to hold your hand or surf in USA. It's not even Balloon Man. You know, it's just, oh, my God. Here we go. We're going to go into the dark. We're going to drill through the depths of the human psyche for 60 or 70 years and then, you know, game over. One of the reasons you go to Dylan is because no matter how desperate things are, his work rings true, you know. Um, I do think that he has come through. There was a long period when I think a lot of people felt like he he basically peaked in 1966 and the whole thing had been a sort of unravelling, you know. And I think people kind of were saying that perhaps right up until Time Out of Mind or even a bit like, you know, he's... That certainly, I, I think certainly, you know, a lot of British people and the British press and things just thought by the 80s, oh, God, you know, it's just, it's over, man. Listen to Subterranean Homesick Blues, you know, don't bother with infidels. And in a way they were right, but I think it was more the, the vibe of the man himself than actually the songs. And if, you know, there's nothing at all wrong with Sweetheart Like You as a song, it's a brilliant song. That goes all the way through, you know, the, the unhappiest records have still got some terrific. Baby, we better talk this over. And um, Senor is a fantastic song. You can take any of them. I mean, even I'm, I'm a talking TV song fan, for example, oh, wow. <laughs> Under the Red Sky. I mean, I yeah. think that's interesting. The point he makes, which I think reflects this, and it's very fair from his point of view, is don't compare me to myself. You know, put this album against other things, which is hard to do, you know, mentally. Yeah. Right. But yeah. if you take Infidels against, line up five or 10 albums that were super popular or super regarded by critics in that year and, yeah. and look at inside infidels. It's, it's fantastic or, or, or many others, but you go, well, it's not blonde on blonde or, and, and that's, he doesn't like it. And I do think it's fair, but I don't know how you take out human psychology. I think, yeah, don't compare him to himself is a really good point, but it's hard not to. And, I, but I think it's a fun, it's a, misunderstanding that people tend to have we tend to have about Dylan you you think you know what it is about him and you think you know what works for you and what doesn't and that's your business that's not even his business or the rock writer's business you you know in yourself which records you enjoy more than others and no one can take that away from you, you and it's no good people beating each up, other up about whether bringing it all back home is better than desire or under the red sky. You know, it's as good as it means to you. Uh, <laughs> but he, I think he is genuinely not the same person from one moment to the next. I think he's an extraordinarily changeable protean being. And maybe that's what sort of keeps him vaguely young in a way is that, and I think also his earlier kind of different incarnations, at least maybe going up to the Christian period, but all that stuff in the 60s, the way he seemed to actually become a different person from record to record, you know, I think he probably was. I think Bowie wore different masks and assimilated different influences. Hey, I'm going to make a soul album, you know, that kind of thing. But I think Dylan actually psychologically probably was you know, if you if you'd looked at him under a microscope, you might have found that his molecular structure changed. And, you know, the, the person you see on the Johnny Cash show in 69 bears no relation to him backstage with Cash in the, the document. It's like they just don't, there doesn't seem to be a connection. I, well, I think that's a pretty unusual gift. <laughs> and, and that's something yeah. that's hard for most, most of us to understand is Dylan's fluidity. And the voice obviously evolved in many ways, but you know, you take the Nashville Skyline voice and I've heard like no credible explanation for it, you know, in 50 years. How do you get that voice out of this guy? It seems miraculous. I don't know. Helium, you know, um, <laughs> it, uh, he said in the interview with Jan Wen, he said, oh, I stopped smoking, but you know, 
I don't think it was that. But he adopted that voice and then it went. It's not like it didn't even sort of ooze in, really. It just suddenly appeared for this one record, the show he did at the Isle of Wight, the things with Johnny Cash. And then by New Morning, it was gone, you know. I don't know. I've never seen an interview. Where, I mean, I'm, I'm sure he'd have some, whatever he said would be some kind of deflection. But, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so you know, it, it, it might just be possessed by different spirits at different times. <laughs> The change in all those masterpieces, those albums that you talked about, obviously is reflected, mm. you know, in the songwriting. To me, those songs on Time Out of Mind, I mean, it, it set the stage for the next three or four albums. How do you as a songwriter and look at those songs as songs? And then I want to ask you about the production, because obviously on that album, that gets a lot of attention. As songs, the Time Out of Mind, well, it's interesting because he alternates kind of 12 bar songs sort of rock and roll, rocky kind of 12-bar songs with, I suppose, what you could call ballads, you know, standing in the doorway and trying to get to heaven and uh, not dark yet and to make you feel my love. And things are all kind of interspersed with things like Cold Irons Bound or Can't Wait. I can't can't remember exactly what the order of them is, but it's pretty much blues to ballad alternating, which is an interesting set up um like i wonder whether it's interesting that mississippi didn't make it onto that record but it made it onto the follow-up whether he didn't like the arrangement or just didn't feel that there was room for it on time out of mind yeah there's i've had this discussion with people there is a time issue that was a 72 minute record at the time when it's kind of the first cd record of bob's and uh you know with with highlands if you put on mississippi you you probably have to lose two things I'm I'm not sure that's the math he did, but it would be interesting to try to figure out what you know what, what to take off. No, I wouldn't take anything off. I know that there were some people were not impressed by the blues numbers, but some of those got to me straight away. And I remember seeing him do Cold Irons Bound in about 2000 at some British gig, and um, suddenly kind of being pinned back. My God, wow! He sounds like Bob Dylan, you know. And what's he doing at a Dylan show? Because to me, Dylan generally only inhabits himself kind of once, if at all, in, in shows. The ones I've seen in the last 40 years or so, he's kind of, he's in there for a bit and then he just, he's doing what he does and playing with the band and, you know, making them think they might do a solo and then not do, you know, whatever he does to amuse himself. And then he, whereas I think he's actually been right back in of late. But no, I, Cold Iron's Bone was, was fantastic. and I. The track, the song that hooked me into it, though, was not dark yet. That was the first thing that I kind of thought, oh, wait a minute. Um, and, uh, you know, so it was maybe, I remember listening to that over and over when Princess Diana was killed and it was just getting dark in Seattle. And it was a fantastic. And it was this time of year, so it was that end of summer, you know, here comes the darkness. Not quite yet, you know, and it just fitted absolutely perfectly with that mood and uh, coincidentally i heard that the 25th anniversary of that is today so um you you were uh you were very uh un- quickly on top of the album it may have been kind of in that in that period yeah yeah you're right so it was i i had a cassette um i had an advanced cassette of it um oh. and that was the one i i picked up on then and then over the next few years i just realized that Often after every gig, I would sit there by myself with a bottle of wine, listening to, it was still on cassette, listening to it, you know. I, for, for some reason, I'd always start, but I'd always start on, um, I think, the one after Standing in the Doorway and then go through. A million to, Miles? Yeah, I never, I've never really, the first couple, I never really got off on Love Sick. I saw him do it, but I... Did you have, there was, there was an abbreviated sampler that circulated or did you have really the full album? I think I had the full album and it must've been a long enough cassette to have Highlands, but I had one of those <laughs> stupid Walkmans that it kind of reversed itself and then you couldn't really tell which way it was going. So it was really right. hard to wind it forward or back. I just have to let it play and then see. So it was forever. It was, it was hopeless. But um, I mean, I, I, the other one I really got into was Highlands, I think just because it's, that is absolutely pure Dylan because it's so sad and not sad, it's just desolate. And 
he's utterly bummed out, but it's also one of the funniest things he's ever done. It's up there with clothesline saga, you know, the, the range up and touch my shirt, you know, that right. one on yeah, um, sure. the tapes, which, which I always thought was a, a kind of takeoff of Ode to Billy Joe, but it just, by the time you get to the hard boiled eggs, you know, it's just, it's great. And, and, and I think as a songwriter, that's one of the things I've learned from Dylan and always try to emulate is to put in really inane lines, comments, scenarios next to whenever, you know, I don't necessarily think, wow, I've got something profound here. But, you know, if, if I'm going to have some observations about life or if I'm going to get down deep and dark, and I don't get down as deep and dark as Dylan, I think partly just because I don't have that voice, you know. I've got this sort of middle-class British newsreader voice that's not, or you know, I, I just don't that, you know, you, D- Dylan has that inflection that just carries with it. It's, it's so nuanced, you know, so ironic. How do you feel about To Make You Feel My Love? With, in, in the fan world, there's a, a lot of consternation about that song. You Any thoughts they, on it? They think it's too mainstream. Yeah. Uh, schmaltzy is a word you yeah. hear, sappy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he's always had an element of, of schmaltz in there. I mean, well, he hasn't always, but sort of since Nashville Skyline, I guess. Maybe even since I'll be That conversation goes on for about 20 more minutes with a discussion of all sorts of additional Dylan and time out of mind topics. Dylan comes up with what might be a perfect arrangement, but it just melts. Oh, I like the sound of it straight away, and I still do. I, I wish he'd make another record with. Daniel Lenoir. I, I think it's always great when you can't quite tell what you're listening to. Oh, it's way past midnight. There's people all around. You know, a very long, a very long song, and instead of Lowlands, it's Highlands. You know, and I, I've never really enjoyed Blind Willie Mattel. It, it sort of just sounds a bit like Hotel California. He's a strong man. You know, he's a sensitive man, but he's strong. He's quite tough. All of these and more is in the extended version of this podcast, available to Plus and premium members. If you've enjoyed our conversations in this series with engineer Mark Howard, musician Wesley Stace, Dylan researcher Scott Warmoth, or others, you'll love the full versions of these and the many more episodes that are coming. And right now you can access them all for as little as $5 a month. I did also talk to Robin a little bit about his own brand new record coming out this week called Shuffle Mania. Maybe we should talk about your new album for, I know we only have a couple, couple of more minutes. My record. Yeah. Yeah. So you made it a few years ago and because of uh, pandemic and album processing, we had to wait, wait till we all heard it. Well, it was written in 2020, pretty much all recorded in at home in Nashville, finished off in London. We did a session at Abbey road in a sort of strange masked way. And, um, and then overdubbed, in terms of getting the, yeah, it just took a long time to finish off. Basic thing was done pretty much, all done by the end of 2020, but but overdubbing, mixing, and then getting it pressed up, you know, because of the lead time. for. You had a lot of remote players, right? A lot of people uh, patched their own pieces on. We did, but all that was done pretty fast. Most of that was done oh. while I was in Nashville. And I think the last contributions to those probably came through in the end of 2020, a little bit of 21. It was all just, it was the final overdubs, doing, redoing some vocals. You know, Emma was quite, she gave the vocals a good going over. Didn't want me to put anything out with us. I can get quite pitchy and people don't tend to let me know that I'm pitchy or I don't notice, you know, so. It's a lovely sounding record. I like, it was nice to have the vinyl to start with. I mean, that's kind of forces you to listen to vinyl when often these days, you know, you might have vinyl, but you know, you'll throw on the stream because it's moving oh, yeah. around with you. And no, there's no stream. Thank you. No, not yet. No, you, you could have got to get to know it the old fashioned way through, through vinyl. And then the cassette will be coming along and the CD. And then I think the streams will be here kind of at Christmas or something, you know, but it's, it's kind of like it's not moving through the years. So we're starting with the earliest format. Uh, well, I'm glad you like it, yeah. All right, Robin. Well, I know uh, we have a time limit, but I, I do appreciate you helping out and, and oh. sharing all these thoughts about time out of mind. 
It's always nice to pontificate about Dylan, you know, chat with fellow Dylanists. Don't forget to subscribe and rate this podcast. It really helps. For bonus episodes and more, become a member at freakmusic.club slash join. And you can follow us on Twitter or Instagram at FMC underscore Dylan. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.